Colorado, and with us is uh, William Neal Pressman. to hear all about Mr. Pressman's experiences in World War II, and we're going to start right at the bottom. Sometimes we start at the top, we start at the bottom, because we want to know where you were born, and your name, and everything, okay? Okay. 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 So talk, we'll start right at the top, like I said, and tell us your name and where you were born, and okay. we'll just take it from there. Okay, you tell me when to start. Right now. Well, my name is William Neal Pressman, and I, the dad's name was William, so I go with the name Neal Pressman, but my social security number, you have to use the whole name, William Neal Pressman. I was born in Holyoke, Colorado. Okay. On May the 12th. 1920, and uh, my graduated from Holyoke High School, and my dad, my mother sent me to Grand Island Business College, and when I was at the Grand Island Business College, I took a civil service test, and I got a civil service job in Washington, D.C. I worked in the State Department. I went to work there on, on uh, November the 11th, 1940, 1940. How old were you? Well, I've just been 20 years old. At 20 that years old, okay. okay. And, and you're working for the government. And uh, I started working at the State Department. I worked for six months in the passport division. And uh, my room, I knew I was going to be drafted sometime. But my roommate worked in the Naval Recruiting Office in uh, Washington, D.C. And he came home one night and he said, there's an opening in the, in the recruiting office in Washington, D.C. He was making more money than I was, so he said, go down and apply. So I thought, well, that's a good idea. So the next day I went down to apply. I went over and I took the test, I passed the test, and they said, to go over and get, a, and they found out I was working in the State Department. Says to go over and get a release from your job, come back, and this afternoon, and we'll swear you in as a second-class showman. So I went over to get a release from my job, but they would not release me. <laughs> but, but, uh, but they couldn't hold me from being drafted in the passport division, so they put me in the division of communication and records. Which, which communicates all the, in all the embassies all over the world. And uh, so I was with the, in the working in the, in the code room in the, in the State Department, right. in different codes. And a month before Pearl Harbor, I put in the code a message from President Roosevelt to Emperor Hirohito trying to avert war. Now this is something you never forget. You know, I, I, I was a me and another guy. Worked with two of us. Took half of the message. I only had half the message, and he had the other half. And we put it in the code, and it was sent to the embassy in US in embassy. Tokyo, and they would deliver it, decoded it then, and deliver it to the. Emperor of Japan. So you took the you took the uh, regular wording, put it regular in the regular wording, code, and put it in the code. Yeah. The reason and, they put it Roosevelt, in the code. And Roosevelt was talking to Hirohito a month before Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Harbor about war. Uh, well, I, yeah, he was trying to work war. He knew that the things were getting that Japan needed more space. They was needed to do something. Uh -huh. and, so, and, uh, and 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 another time when I was working in the code room. At 4 o'clock in the morning, I worked from 12 o'clock at night until 4 o'clock in the morning, or 8 o'clock in the morning. And while at 4 o'clock one morning, we got a real important messages for Secretary of State Cordell Howe. Right. And I, another guy and I got to go over to his hotel at 4 o'clock in the morning, and wake him up, and give him this message. And he asked us to wait then until he sent a message back. And I'll never forget that time either to wake up a, a Secretary of State at 4 o'clock in the morning. And what was that about, do you know? No, I can't, I remember what that was about, no. <laughs> you, 
Did but, you, you didn't have any inkling about it. Was no. that after the was that after the war started, or was that? Uh, well, I, I don't remember now, but it was it had to do with things that was happening, and they needed to know right away. Okay. They needed a decision. Emergency. And so, on uh, December the 13th, 1943, well, I was deferred then for two years. So I, was, I started work there in November of 40, but in December of 13th, 1943, I got drafted. Okay. So I headed, I got a, came home, and I went to Fort Logan, Colorado, and I was inducted into the Army then, on, I think it was about 1st or 2nd of January of 1944. And then I tried to join the Air Corps. But in high school, I had uh, rheumatic fever. And they found that out, so they wouldn't let me join. But so, they'd take you in the Army. Huh? But they'd take you in the well, Army. Well, so uh, I met another guy at Fort Logan. And, uh, and he had been in the Army before. And uh, so we, they put us on a train, and we, we didn't know where we were going. We got to St. Louis, and we stayed all night in St. Louis, and they took us out of the, of the train in St. Louis, fed us for breakfast in the depot, and then we were heading on east, and we kept going and going and going, and then finally we seen a sign that says IRTC. We said, what the world is IRTC? We found out that it means Infantry Training Replacement Center. Oh, boy. So we took 17 weeks of basic training, and, uh, and, and then ended up, we finished. What, let me ask you about the basic training. What did that amount to? What do you remember about that? Was it just well, exercises it just, and it, it, it just, so forth? It just took you out and exercises, and, and, we, and then we had, you know, to fire guns and implements, and we had to, well, it, anyway, it was try, trying to make us, Tell you what could happen to be, if you were in the service, and so that's that's what it was all about. It was just trying to get you ready to, for infantry training. Okay. And we even went crawled underneath the, on on the ground underneath the barbed wire when they were shooting actually live shells just a few feet above us. Right. To keep your head keep, down. Keep, totally to keep your head down. Right. And so I'm about to say they. D-Day was on June the 6th of 44, and that was just about the time that we completed our 17 weeks of basic training. But they gave us, they gave us uh, two weeks delay en route. We could come home before we went overseas. And so my wife, she had her job, and that's where I met my wife, was in Washington, D.C., at the same rooming house. And uh, so, so what I got... Was your, what was your wife doing there? Well, she worked for the Air, Air Force. For the Air Force? Yeah, she had, she, had she had a civil service job also. Okay. Worked and where did your wife come from? She came from Minnesota. Minnesota? Uh, she came from Minnesota. Was and that's where we met in this rooming house in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. Uh, well, pretty terrific. Yeah. And, uh, let's see. And then uh, we had two days delay in, delay in route. And I, I stopped in Fort Mer Meade, Maryland, which is just right outside Washington, D.C. Okay. And when I was there, I was only there two days, but one day I went in to see her and she came out to see me, so we missed each other. Uh -oh. But when I got, next day I went to Washington, went to New York, and then she did come, got hold of her, and we met at the hotel in New York before I was, she was shipped overseas. And I, came, I went over on the, then on the, uh, it was a British warship, it's Queen Elizabeth. Okay. There was 22,000 troops on this ship. Wow. And we all had, you either had a blue ribbon, a white ribbon, or a red ribbon. So if you had, you could only stay on a certain part of the ship. Because you can understand if you had 22,000 on one side of the ship, it'd probably have to step it over. <laughs> right. So you had to stay in your, your position to keep the ship balanced. And we were eight, we were, you know, six days crossing the Atlantic, and we landed at uh, 
and uh, uh, and what was the name of the Ta the, 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 the no is in oh <laughs> with the Sherberg no no he said the Okay, yeah. but they so, so you landed at Glasgow. Glasgow. 22,000 guys. 22,000 troops. All right. But the ship was so big, it, it couldn't get up to the dock. Right. So they, they brought out boats and took, took off 2,000 at a time. The Queen Elizabeth was 1,031 feet long. I can remember that really the, because that was my wife's street number where she lived in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> Her address was 1031 13th Avenue Northeast, and so I always remember the, the length of that ship was the 1031. <laughs> and we spent all day, well, we got there in the afternoon, and then they took us down to Yeovil, England. And when we got to Yeovil, England, and then they gave us our... How did you get down to Yeovil, by truck? By, tr by train. By train. Okay. Train, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, we stopped at some little town in England, and the, the women came out and brought us uh, cups of tea and right. donuts or something, and they uh, always appreciated all that. But, but in, the, in the England, they, I think they put, anyway, they, they served their tea a little different. And the Americans didn't appreciate it as like they should have. Right. But then we got to down to Yeovil, England, and that's where they would give us our M1, M1 rifles, and that's where we had them zeroed in. Okay. And I had a wonderful rifle. I, when I could, I put, I could put uh, eight, a clip of eight rounds in the bullseye about two feet square at 500 yards. Wow, is that right? And. <laughs> That's so so I, I had it really zeroed in, and then we, and then we, before we left to go across the channel, the chaplain talked to us and he says, tomorrow at this time, some of you guys will be back here in the hospital, some of you guys will be dead, and it didn't sound very interesting, Not but he, he told us what we could look for. Right. But now this was about three weeks after D-Day, the time we landed at Omaha Beach. We left Southampton, England, right. and we landed in Omaha Beach by a, a, just the same, same landing crafts as the, they did used when they on D-Day. LST. So we, uh, LST, we, we, we got off, uh, we, had, we had to jump out into the water about waist deep, but that, that there wasn't any firing going on at that time the, at Omaha Beach. But we could, the front line was only 15 miles in. We could hear a rifle fire, and, and one time in the afternoon, we was waiting to, to be taken up to our outfit that night, and we seen one of the German buzz bombs, one of those, I think it's what they call it. V2. V2s? Yeah. We seen those go up, and it just, it just looked like a boxcar, taking off real slow, and then gradually gaining speed. It was, Something you never forget. And then at 11 o'clock at night, they was going to take us up to our outfit. I was headed for the Third Armored Division. And we was in a convoy of five trucks, and we went to a, just a little village, and our five trucks were, I think we was in the, I forget who was in, we were in the last three or the first two. Anyway, our, our convoy was split in two, and you got, and they, we was only, fr front line was 15 miles in, and that was 11 o'clock at night. At four o'clock the next morning, the guy was still driving. Been driving for five <laughs> hours, and the front line was 15 miles. You were and behind we had, the lines, huh? We had our rifles at that time, yeah. but no ammunition. Oh my gosh. At one, at one time, there was some mortars around and landing around us. I think we must have, we could have went through enemy lines and turned around and came back. Yeah. But four o'clock in the morning, how many of you were in those trucks, would you guess? How many guys in the truck? In, in, in truck? I yeah. suppose there's about 20 or 25 20, yeah. in the truck. 
He just we oh, pretty yeah, about, loaded. A, a pretty total of about 100 men. Yeah, yeah. and at 4 o'clock in the morning, we come to an apple orchard, and the, the truck driver told us to, they told us to dig in. And so we got out and started digging us a pothole. And uh, of course, at that in, Ju in uh, June, in, in that time part of the country, the sun was already up. This was at 4 o'clock in the morning. Because you only have about five hours of, of a darkness in England in, in June and July. So, and then they, what they did, then the 83rd Infantry was close by, so that's where they put me, in the 83rd Infantry. In doing so, my service charger got lost, and uh, so I never got paid the whole time I was over there. And uh, Maybe you weren't there. Huh? Maybe you weren't yeah. there. <laughs> Go ahead. We, got, we joined the 83rd Infantry, and then, and, uh, we went, we, I think we were pretty close to St. Lowe. What was your, what was your rank then? Were you a private? I was a, I was a private. Private, I was, okay. I was drafted, I was drafted, I was, I was, I was just a private. Right, okay. And, uh, and we went by St. Lowe, and while we were at St. Lowe, we were, we were south of St. Lowe, just a few miles, and we seen our Air Corps come over and drop bombs. We seen the bombs falling. And according to our POW magazine I get every month, there's a story in there that when they was bombing St. Lowe, they, they, they had dropped some flares to, to, to tell them where to drop the bombs, but the wind changed and they dropped the bombs in the wrong place and there was 2,500 Americans killed by our own bombs. Yeah. A story you never hear. That's Hard that's, to believe. But that's what I, you know, these little interviews I've been doing, we hear a lot of stories <laughs> that we've never heard. Just like And then this. we went to St. Malo, which is is uh, west of uh, St. Lo, which is down on the, on the French coast. And when we were at St. Malo, our, our squad, there was a chateau out on the, out on the, uh, it's just in the water, kind of a building, and our bombers come over and bombed that and uh, strafed it. And the Germans came out of there. There's about 200 Germans come out of, out of there, and there was only about 10 of us in our squad. And when they came out, they had their hands up, to about 200 Germans. And uh, our squad leader, he had a burp, uh, one of the, the burp gun, one of those, oh, that's a, oh, it's that hold 20 rounds, I forget what they call it. Burp gun? And no, it's not a burp gun, it's a... Like a Thompson submachine gun? It's a, anyway, he, he, this guy was holding his hand up, but, but then the first thing he knew, he put, there was a guy behind him, and he bent over, and they had, he had a machine gun on his back, and he opened up, and they gave him all 20 rounds, and they killed him. But we, I can remember we captured 200 men, just our, Ten Why? of you guys captured 200 men. 200 men, yeah. Wow. But when, when, when we were there at St. Malo, that was the first time that the, like the Red Cross came up and they served us coffee and donuts. <laughs> and that's the only time we ever, we've ever seen them in there the whole time I was over there. There that, was no uh, place to be seen. Yeah, I was at St. Malo. Did you see the Salvation Army much? Do you remember them at all? Well, not over there, no. Yeah, huh? okay. Anyway, after we left St. Malo, they put us on, we were on outposts on the Lower River. On the Lower River, we, one night they put us, uh, three of us, they put on, we stayed at this, this building down on, on the other side of the river. The bridge was bombed, it was broke, tore up on this side of the river, so you couldn't go across on the bridge. But we were supposed to we keep a machine gun there and, and, and just observe what was happening. We could see the Germans across the river. The Lower River was a wide, about a mile or so wide. Right. And we could see them, trucks and stuff going on over there. And, and but our where we, little house we stayed in, we had to walk clear away around and back down the hill, back to where the house was down in the, behind the kind of a hill. But, uh, when the, where the bridge 
road came across the bridge, our house was just a short distance away. So after about a day or two, you get tired of walking clear around here, so I was going to walk across here. In doing so, they opened up with a 20 millimeter mortars, uh, anyway, a shell that explode on contact. Yeah. And one of them landed about two feet from me, right in front of me. So after that, I walked around. You didn't, didn't <laughs> take the shortcut anymore. You didn't take the shortcut anymore. You were lucky, weren't you? But there's, in the, in the nighttime, there was... So a, did you get wounded then? No. Okay. There was a, at the nighttime, there was this, we could see little boats creeping up along the river, but a, we don't know if there's anybody in the night, maybe there's just a loose boat. But, but then in the daytime, it's French, uh, it's French civilians walking down this road. They could have been German soldiers in civilian clothes, and we would never have known it. But they'd just be hundreds walking up and down the road. And so it was something you never forget. Not paying any attention to the <laughs> war. Huh? There, there were three of us, and one guy, he wanted to go back to the little village about a oh, half mile back, and he wanted to go back to that village, and they told us, if you go back there, just the boys two go together. So I went with him, and we went back to this little village one, uh, one night, and they gave us, we got in contact with some people on the street, and they took us to their house and gave us a, ma a meal, they gave us little drillings, and they gave us something to eat, and they, and they asked the questions, talked with them. We were told not to do that, but we, we got to talking to them. You and were they, fraternizing. Yes, they are. <laughs> but then... So let me ask you, Okay, you were on. You were watching the Lower River uh, as a uh, you know kind of guards, as a, and what were you eating all that time? Did you just have well, the rations and stuff, or what happened? The the our army or cook or they were supposed to bring us up a certain spot every day. They were supposed to bring up uh, food. our food, and okay. then we go back there and get it. And uh, it, uh, it, that's where we got. Got Did deep. you have radio with you and stuff? No, there would be be runners r runners that come up every day to get what oh, information what? which we would have see in, in, in contact what we see across the river. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then we was on this river on outposts, different outposts for you know this. I see. I landed in about the third week in June, and then in in uh, oh, it must have been. Latter part of August, in September, about the middle of about September, and they took us by truck then to Luxembourg, the city of Luxembourg. Luxembourg. We were the first Americans in the city of Luxembourg. See, there's a, a country Luxembourg and also the city of Luxembourg. And when we were in Luxembourg, we it was raining, and but when, when we got there, these French, we were the first Americans in there. And they came out and give us bottles of wine and the whole stuff, just just so happy to see us, and just beautiful containers with, with glasses, you know. And some of the guys would drink it and give the glasses. I tell you, it made me made me disgusted that they didn't show their appreciation of, right. of the jug or the, what they give us. But we, the first night we slept there, it was raining, and we had two in the infantry. You had a shelter half. Right. And two of the guys slept together, so we put up our tent, and it was all, it was about mud, it just two or three inches of mud. So we went and seen a barn, we found this barn, and found some bales of hay. So we got some hay and put down in our, in our uh, tent, and we got bowled out that next day because they said, we're going to have to pay for that hay. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when they left, Luxembourg, well, I, my, platoon, my squad uh, guarded a B-17 that, would, that had fallen and crash landed in Luxembourg. And we, we, they, we were supposed to guard that to make sure that the Germans didn't come in there and, and capture, take the bomb site. Right. So right. we had to, we, we slept in this B-17 then for about a week then while they, to the Air Corps came up and took out the bomb site. And then we, out the Norden bomb site. Yeah. yeah. Then we got to. Uh, then we got on into southern Luxembourg. And uh, we was in a just 
we were kind of just on a holding position, and uh, we uh, we could see the Germans across the on the other side of the river, and they were our, our artillery would would fly would go over, and every once in a while would land on the other side of the river, and one day we were sitting up on the hill, and just 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 waiting, and they hear these artillery going over, and and all at once as there was a, one of them come short. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't know. And, and anyway, there was some shrapnel or something come back. We was, we was sat in there playing cards beside of a tree, and a piece of, I seen it hit the tree here, looked over, and boy, that burnt my hand. And the shrapnel. And then, and then, you know, then we stayed in a small town down in, the, the, right on the Moselle River. And when we were there for several days, I mean, we stayed in at somebody's building. And uh, you know, you feel, you feel like kind of funny just just going in somebody's house and staying there. We they had charcoal burners to heat the hot water so we could take a shower. <laughs> and uh, and uh, at that time, they was they were supposed to bring us up on a certain hill. There was an iron cross. So every night we'd go up there to that cross, and there would be no food. So after about a few days, we was getting hungry, and, and I found a barn that had, had there some cows in it. It hadn't even been milked for I don't know how long. So I had my helmet, and I was in there milking. I milked the cow, and we had some chocolate chocolate powder. We were probably making chocolate uh, cocoa. Yeah. So I milked. I was milking when I was milking this milking the cow. A mo German motors across the river came over and landed right on top of that building. Wow. And it was, it had, uh, it, it was a hay mile up above, of course, it had a lot of hay up there. And then, of course, it had the tile roof, and I could hear them over tile roof of flight flying off. So I, uh, I got out of there pretty quick. I'll bet. And, uh, and then we, we had, we had some hot cocoa. And then the next day that we found a hog, little pig running up down the street, we got him and, and of course we, we butchered him and we couldn't cook him in the daytime because of the uh, smoke. So we waited after dark so, so they couldn't, Germans couldn't see the, where we were at with my, the smoke. And so um, on the fifth day of September, on the fifth day of November, the Sunday, on Sunday morning, 1944, our platoon was, was was going to go out and scout around the hill that day, and there was a, another fellow in there. His name was Percy Peacock. He was from uh, Kenley, North Carolina, and him and I were our turn to be scouts. So we <coughs> we was out in front of our I don't know if it was a company or a platoon. Anyway, we was ahead of them, and we couldn't see them behind us. And we were walking. Nice, a nice Sunday morning, about eight o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, just walking around and looking at everything, and all of a sudden, the machine gun opened up. And of course, the machine gun opens up, you try to find a place to hide. I had a perfect spot. The water had washed down a hill, and they had put in a cement block about two or three feet high to keep the water from washing the very bigger gullies out, and there was weed growing out above that. I spread them weeds apart and looked, and you know, I could see the I could see the German machine gunner. I could see him just about just like that. And never so every time I'd fire, another guy'd get up. I don't know how many times I fired. And on then pretty soon up the hill, come the, there are mortars, and the last one landed about as close as you to, as I am to you, but I was below it, and they kicked dirt all over me. And boy, I couldn't hear nothing. And I happened to think about Percy. I said, Percy, you okay? He said, no, I got, he just laid down on top of the ground. He said, no, I got trapped on my shoulder and my hip. And, and I happened to think, well, shoot, I'm the only one firing. I wonder what happened to our platoon. And I found out years later that they had moved back. But anyway, I didn't know what to do. I happened to remember coming up the hill there was a road back there with about 10 or 12 foot foot bank, and I thought, I thought Percy, he says, 
I'm going to fire, and you go back and get behind that bank, and then when you get back there, you fire, and I'll come back. Well, I waited and gave him time to get back, but he never did fire. So I got up and started to run back, and when I did run back, I got a bullet in the shoulder, and I got back to where that road was that I, there's trees and branches up there, and I slid through there, and I slid down that bank, and I, la I landed on my knees and lost my rifle, and I, I was going to grab my rifle, and I looked around like that, turned my head, and I seen why he didn't fire. Two Germans had him. So I thought, boy, I couldn't, in uh, two seconds, I didn't know what to do. I was going to grab my rifle anyway, and I think, I don't believe I got a clip in it. <laughs> so in the two seconds, I was thinking what to do. Two Germans came over, stuck two rifles in their back, and in perfect English, they said, for you, the war is over. Oh, no, really? Yeah. For you, the war is over. Uh, boy, they're going to shoot me. And, uh, and then they, they, take, they took us in. And at that time, I still had some uh, grenades. hand grenades on yeah. me. And, and they, they didn't pay attention to them. Of course, I left my rifle land down on the ground. And they took us down to the Moselle River and put us on a, a little canoe they had. We went right across the river got on the other side, we just got to the other side, and here come our own artillery up on that hill. So that, that's the reason I always thought that our company had moved back, but why would our company throw artillery up there if, if they knew we were up there? But then little several rounds went up there, and then uh, here, if you ever heard one coming in short, the Germans, he, he knew it too, so there was a railroad overpass just about 100 feet away, so we ran over, we were heading for that underpass, and we just got underneath the underpass when our own artillery landed out there and hit the boat that we just got out of wow. and blew it all to pieces. Wow. <laughs> well, I figured we was lucky. Yes, I think so too. And then they, they took us up to their first aid station then, which was on the other, in Germany, on the other side of the, out of Chuckles, out of Luxembourg, over in the, he was on the other side of the Melrose, Moselle River. I don't know whether it was that'd be France or Germany. Anyway, anyway, they we uh, they took us to this first aid station. They didn't give us anything to eat, but they did give me a shot of cognac. After dark, they took Percy and I and three German soldiers that were shot in the chest in an ambulance up to I don't know where they took us, but they took us to some place and they inter interrogated us. And of course, we were told that if they give your name, rank, and serial number, and that's all we were supposed to say. But they told me what boat I came over on. I never told them, never told them that they were right. They told me that I came over on the Queen Elizabeth. They even told me where I took my training in Florida. Is that right? But I never, I never told them that they were right. Real intelligence. They huh? were intelligent. Yeah, they had good intelligence, huh? <laughs> anyway, they took us to to Limburg, Germany, after they interrogated us, we took, well, I've heard before that, that I spent three weeks in three different German hospitals. Okay. Because of my, they, my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Of course, we, we, the, we, we carried pills to take if we were wounded. And I, they, we took, carried 10, and I took 10, the sulfur pills. Yep. And I think, I think that's what, when I took those sulfur pills, my blood was running out of my, where I, where I took them, the blood was actually just dripping out of my sleeve. And I took those sulfur pills. You're not supposed to take them unless you got a full canteen of water. I took the, the pills and you, almost, almost instantly, your blood thickens up and you quit bleeding. I think that's, I think that's what saved my life. Just, Goes by. You know who invented the sulfur? Pardon? You know who invented sulfur? No. The Germans did. Is that right? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think that's what. You know, that that. But the, you know, my arm never did hurt after that. Of course, the bullet was still in there. But after I got to the German hospital, there was a French doctor who was a prisoner of war. Took the bullet out of my arm. And uh, this. The second hospital I was in, 
I was in the, in the hospital with uh, eight German soldiers, and the German soldier right next to me, he had infection in his middle finger, and he thought I needed a haircut. He took me down to the barber in the hospital and paid for my haircut. <laughs> Is and that it, right? Yeah, and uh, Hitler's wall picture was on the wall. And there was a couple guys ahead of me, so I to my motion to me to wait and to get my hair cut and then come on back to the room. So that's what I did. But when I came back, went back to the room, I had to cross a courtyard, and there was big doors open. I thought, boy, here's my chance to get away. Well, I tried to, when I was thinking what to do, two guards walked across the gate, yeah. so I went on back to the room. Took care of that, did it? But I, ate, I was there for several days, and I ate the same thing that Germans did. I ate at the same table. And uh, on the second or third day, there was a, across the room, there was a young German soldier. He was just maybe 19, just young, young boy. How old were you then? Well, I was, well that was in 20, I was 24. I was 24. 44. I was 24. And uh, his, his mother and I, I think his, must have been his girlfriend come to see him, and they brought him some food, and they gave me some. And uh, I just thanked them, you know. And but when they did that, was giving me this food, our air, our bombers was coming overhead, and they called that Americana Wolfwolf. Americana Wolfwolf. <laughs> Americana Wolfwolf. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, and then the the next hospital was in the last hospital. They was just I was just I was in a room with about eight or ten. Just all Americans, but they were all prisoners of the war. Right. But while we were there, they, we heard a heard a the airplane, and we went over and looked out the window, and we seen uh, our our plane was shooting at a truck on the ground. And what was interesting, if you see these tracer bullets come out and hit that truck, and just just that quick. The tracer bullets would be just as high as the plane was over here. Is that, that right? Bounce up? Huh? Yeah. That was kind of interesting. But then the truck had stopped. The truck, he, the driver had got out and crawled underneath, but the, they brought him in the hospital a short time later. He had been one of those big bullets that went through his leg. <laughs> oh, man. And when I was at this hospital, there was a German nurse talking to me one day, and, uh, and, uh, So, Mr. Sure. President, do you speak German? What? Do you speak German? No. Oh, okay. But I, she could, she could speak more English than I could speak German. Okay. But she had a boyfriend who was a prisoner of war here in the United States, and she gave me a card to write to my wife. And, of course, we were, we were, being a prisoner of war, you're allowed to write one card a month. Well, the first card I wrote after, uh, when I was first after I was first captured in November, and, but she gave me this card now, it was in December. And she says, I will put that in the German civilian mail. You, th you think the wartime was that a civilian mail work? But my wife got this second card that the German nurse had put in the civilian mail that latter part of February before she got the first one. Yeah, and that, that's when she found out, if she knew that I was missing in action, that's when she found out that I was, a, was alive and was a prisoner of war. Wow. And her, her, her girlfriend, where they stayed in Washington, D.C., got the card that day while she was at work and called her at work and told her that they got a card from me. And then her, her boss at, at work told her, she just walk home <laughs> for the day. Yeah. Take the day. Huh? Yeah, to take the day off. So that's when she found that out that I was a prisoner of war. And then when we, when I left that last hospital, there was just one German soldier who took me and who put me on a train. And we got down to the railroad station. There were a lot of German soldiers. And uh, well, I'm making this too long. No. Anyway, we got down to the German soldiers, and all standing around, and and he was standing right beside me, and then he said something to me, and he was gone. And here I was, all by myself, looking all around, and thought, boy, this is my opportunity to get away. 
But just about the time I was thinking, which way, I didn't know which way was, of course it was the night time, I didn't know which way was Brooks. I was thinking about what to do. Here he was, right beside me again. I think he was just, he was still wanting me, I think. Checking you out. But anyway, they put me on a train, and on, the, on, our, on our German train, the aisle is not down the middle, it's on the outside. And they, we was, they put us in one big compartment, the bench on this side and bench on the other side. He lay down on this side and I laid on that other side. And I don't know how long we rode on that train, but then we came, to, after a while we came to a, a, a small town and uh, we got out, got out at the depot and there was a, they, they, put, they took us down in the railroad depot, several stories down. And uh, it, was, it was just in a small room and there was, there was a German with us as a, with a swastika band on his arm. And he had a briefcase, because that time I still had my helmet. But he wanted to see my helmet, and so I gave him my helmet. And while he, he had this briefcase, he opened up his briefcase and pulled out two sticks and screwed it together just like a milk stool, kind of like a farmer. Yeah. Made him a stool, he could sit down. So he sat down, and then he opened up the other part of his briefcase, and he made himself a sandwich. But he never did give us it. <laughs> but then after we left there, then they put us on another train, and we went to... Uh, Limburg, Germany, that's where Stalag 12A was. Within Stalag 12A, in latter, in latter, about the third week in December, that's when the Battle of the Bulls was taking place. Right. And they brought, while well, I was at Stalag 12A, they brought in, they brought in truckloads of American soldiers. They were captured, and they were, hadn't even got off the truck. They hadn't even been given any ammunition, and they didn't even have a rifle. But they were captured right on the truck. Oh, they were captured before they got in the they action. Got, they got, yeah, before they got in action, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, we was at 12, Stalag 12A for a couple of days. And when we left 12A, we went to 4B. But I found out later, the day after we left 4B, 12A, that it was bombed by the British, and there was 50 American officers killed by our own bombs. Wow. Now, but 12A was a, was a German was prison was camp. It was a Stalag, yeah. yeah. And while I was at 12A, there was a small river creek run by, and one night there was a, I heard a plane went, <laughs> what the heck was that? I'd never heard a plane like that before. That's the first jet plane I ever heard, ever saw. A German jet. Yeah, the German jet. You know, motor plane, was, you hear the motors. But while we were at the 12A, we seen a B-17 shot down. And it just circled around and got clear out of sight. And when we left 12A, then we went to 4B, which is, we got to 4B, they put us, uh, uh, we was there for about one day, the fumigator to close. They had to take all our clothes off and they were, Fumigator, because we all had lice, lice, and we was there. Well, the next day after we left 12A, they put us on a. There was 200 of us on boxcar. They put about 60 or more of us in each boxcar, what they call a four-bay boxcar, and we rode this boxcar four days, five nights without food or water, and the only. The latrine we had was a five-gallon bucket sitting by the door, but then, but then this was in the winter time. It was cold. It was zero outdoors, and you'd be frost on the bolt heads in the in the railroad car. Guys would be up flicking the frost off of those bolt heads. But we all couldn't sit down at one time. There were so many of us in there. We had to take turns of sitting down. And it was like I said, in there four days and five nights, and we got to. Oberkaminant, Czechoslovakia. And when we were in Oberkaminant, Czechoslovakia, we was about a half a mile from the town. That's where they put us, we had to go to a work camp. We had to walk eight kilometers or five miles to work each day, work 10 hours, pick and shovel, 
and back to the stallo before we got anything to eat for the day. And then they gave us, I had a bushel of rutabagas to put in, the dirt and peelings and all, for, for 200 men. I have, I have made soup for 200, just a bushel of rutabagas. Wow. And then we got a, a, a kilo loaf of bread for five, for five, that's a, yeah, that's a kilo, that's a thousand grams. It was, what, 453 grams in a pound? Kilos, 2.2 .2 pounds. Yeah, yeah, this is a kilo. This is just a round loaf about that big around and about that thick. And they, the five men, and the same five men would have that possession of that bread every day, and they, we'd take turns of cutting it. The guy that cut the bread, he got the last piece. <laughs> so you make sure you got, got it even. But then we were supposed to make that bread last us all day. But the way it turned out, you would, you would eat it right away because if you didn't, somebody else would get it and eat it. <laughs> so you, that's how you eat it bread, you eat it every day. And, uh, and uh, was that, that was heavy, heavy bread. That was you know, that dark oh, bread. Oh, that was heavy bread, yeah. yeah. I, I forget the ingredients of the, it showed us in our Persian War magazine one day, but it was 40% bruised rye grain, 20% tree flour, which is sawdust. Oh, <laughs> and uh, I forget what the other percentage was. It, it was but we, 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 you would find sticks of wood in sticks, it. Sticks, yeah, right. But, we're, but the sawdust, I think, was the only thing that kept us going. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, before we got to work, first we got there, we worked on a railroad overpass and uh, where they were trying to build a road, road down to this, this or we were digging this tunnel underneath the ground where the Germans were going, had planned to put their aircraft factory underneath the ground. That's what they were building these tunnels for. But when, they, when we were working on the, to get the railroad down to this, to where they're digging the tunnels, one day I seen a woman kind of sneaking around uh, and uh, she got a apron full of something. And then when the guards walked out of sight, she come over here and dumped her apples on the ground and then left. You know, you never forget things like that. Yeah. She, she dressed her life. She knew that we weren't, weren't getting enough to eat. Yeah, <laughs> and then, the, and then, well, we, we, like I said, we had to walk five mile, five kilo, eight kilometers, five miles back and forth to work. Every day, going through this town, we had to go through this town onto the other side of the town. We walked past the meat market. And you can see these meat hanging in the window. And then uh, on May the 8th, so that morning, that morning, well, before, before that, we, we had to, all this walking we had to do. My legs, my ankles were bigger than my legs up here. And my, in fact, I, one morning I got, I just, I, it hurt so bad I couldn't get going anymore, so they put me on sick call. And, and doing so, then they sent me back to a prison war hospital, which they put me on the train, they took me there. And while I was at this prison war hospital, there was a, had, had walls that had Russians on one side and we were on the other side and, and and there was a American boy died while I was there and uh, they uh, and another guy and I was maybe the best able of, of those who were in the hospital but they asked us to go bury him they put him in the wooden box all right and uh, and they put it on a four-wheel steel cart. And we had to pull this cart five miles all uphill to a cemetery in Bodenbeck, Czechoslovakia. Wow. And the, there was a guard with us, and he took us, showed us where to dig, a tombstone was turned over, and he sat on another tombstone. Well, they told us to dig, and so we started digging. And in noontime, they brought him lunch, but they didn't bring us anything. And one time he turned his head away and I had a shovel. I thought, boy, this is my opportunity. And the two seconds I was thinking what to do, I seen, looked up and I seen two guards walked across the cemetery gate. 
So I, I'm Not sure glad I didn't do anything. Right. And uh, and so we dug his grave, and we, him and I, two of us, tried to, to get him down into the his whole box down into his hole, and he he hit the bottom kind of hard. But we was, while we were digging the grave, I dug out four, a huge three human skulls, and a whole bunch of human bones. And then when we was filling the hole back up, the guard was saying something. I couldn't understand what he was saying, but finally I figured out he wanted us to put those bones back in before we got it covered up. Oh yeah. So anyway, then when, we, when I got back to the work camp then, before the war was over, and. Uh, I had to go back to work again, and well, but on May the eighth, what was wrong with your legs? Huh? What was wrong with what they? The our diet. What just, was wrong with our diet? Just, yeah. Because our legs. And while I was at this prisoner of war hospital, there was a guy there. His legs were swollen up, but his whole legs, whole split, all the way up. It was so tight that he had a gash the whole way down, all the way. Wow. And, but. But I was only there a couple of days, and they took him to another hospital. So, I, in fact, I had, I, in my condition, I carried him to the bathroom. Exactly. But then they, they took him to another hospital, so I don't know whatever happened to him. Oh, my. And uh, when they got back to the style log then, on May the 8th, they, the, went, and that morning, usually we had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to, to fall out at 6 to go to work. Well, four o'clock that morning came, we got up, six o'clock came, and eight o'clock came, and we were still there. We knew something was up. 10 o'clock came, the German guard, our sergeant in charge of our camp, called us together, and before the war, he was a used car salesman in Newark, New Jersey. Sure, is that right? But he could speak a little English. See? Sure. And so he was, he got, at eight, 10 o'clock they called us together and said he was going to put a whole month's ration into one meal and feed us and take us back to the American line. So we had our meal. Boy, was, in fact, I think they must have put a little flour in it because it was thicker that time. We had our meal. We just got on on the road. There's a lot of refugees on the road. And we heard a plane. And here come American P-51 with a Russian red star on it and come in on a dive. And said, as soon as they started to come in on a dive, I was running side to side with the German guard, get off the road, and they opened up with that machine guns on that plane, and they got a hitting the road here, about from far distance where my wife was at right now. You could hear they see it hitting, and of course the refugees had, there was quite a few horses killed that time. Some of them were just wounded, they had to, they, they, Guys was with the, had the horses they had to finish kill them off. Yeah. But then I don't. I think our our so our 200 must have got off the road because I don't remember anybody saying we got anybody got hurt because as soon as they claimed they were to die, we knew it enough to get off the road. Right. But then we walked till midnight that night, and we got to some barely in middle town that had a. Well, big, you know, big like this, room like this, we'd step on the floor. And when we woke the next, up the next morning, the guards were gone. That's how they got away, because I figured, oh, I figured they well, dumped I, you. Because whatever had happened, some of the guys would try to kill some, so that, they were gone. Why, right, which way do you go? There's five of us stayed together. A lot of the guys said, let's go south to, to Prague, Czechoslovakia. No, that's, I didn't want to go south. I said, let's go west. So we, we figured we'd hit the front line going west quicker. So we started, started walking west. That was on May the 9th. And on May the, and then on, on the night of May the 9th then, we slept by a straw pile. And it was on a, some farmhouse or somewhere, and so we, they were digging around in their straw to lie down, and the Germans had, Germans had had some bread in there. So we, I, I don't know how long that bread had been in there, but well, we ate it anyway. But I got too much, I ate too much, and boy, I got sick the next day. <laughs> and uh, one of the five guys we, we, I was with, 
One of them lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I still keep in contact with him. And uh, and uh, his name is his name was Dan Ivasovic, with a Serbian name, and he could his family was from Serbia, and he could he could uh, speak understand Czechoslovak language. So he was helping us out. Yeah, that's and, great. Uh, so the next day I got sick and he was talking to some woman on the, on the, on the road. We had come into a little small town and she was nodding her head yet like this. And, and she took off and she wasn't gone but just a short time she came back with a hot cup of tea, a big tablespoon of charcoal and gave me. And you know, that, that, that picked me up, it took the gas out of my stomach and came like, back like that. I felt much better just almost immediately. And she asked us to sleep on her porch that night, and then the next morning she fed us breakfast before we left. Wow. That, was on the, that was on the morning of the 10th. And uh, I always wished I would have gotten her name, but I, I didn't. And of course, the time you think about it, why well, it's too late. Then we got, <clears throat> we, we kept it going, and, and on, on, on May the 12th then, was the, which was my birthday, we got to Osseg. I don't know whether this was in Czechoslovakia or whether it's in Germany, but it's a little town on the Elbe River, on the west side of the Elbe River, it's named Osseg. And we we could see the Russians were there in there. We could see their horses and wagons, and so we didn't know whether we wanted to get to go in there or not. Right. But then that's the only place we could cross. They had some ferries going across, so we decided to go across anyway. So we went across. When we got over there, we found a room which had, a building had been occupied by the Germans previously. And there was electric lights, there were a lot of, hundreds of bunks, and there was had hot water. We took our first shower in seven months. Wow. On May the 12th, my birthday. <laughs> and I even found a clean pair of underwear. <laughs> and the uh, next day, we found a, something like a Red Cross where we got something to eat. And we were walking down the road street, there was a Russian wagon coming up the road. And there was two of them, one was driving the horses. And they had more wagons than we ever could dream of. And they had a machine gun between them and they had a the other guy was playing the guitar and they had a bottle of vodka in between them. They stopped to talk to us. They seen we were, we were Americans. And he rushed in the back end of his wagon and pulled out a can of meat with the Argentina, South America label on it, and gave us a loaf of bread. <laughs> yeah, we ate that meat, it was good. That was a big time, wasn't it? Was it was in a sealed can, you know, right. can, can. Yeah. But it come from Argentina, South America. Wow. <laughs> and, and then we heard that there was a train leaving for Paris. But boy, that's the one we want to get on. And, uh, so we, uh, well, we finally got on a streetcar and found it down where the train was, but it was all boxcars. And but it was plumb full of French political prisoners trying to head home. And, but we found one, I had a little room on top. So we, there was one guy up on top up there, so we got up with him, and he turned out to be a Greek soldier that was in the British Army, and he wasn't going to try to get back to England to get his discharge. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the train would go a little way and stop. The railroads were kind of more than too good a shape. The railroad go, they'd go a little way and stop. And the first time we got outside of town a little bit, they seen one, uh, there was a building and had been bombed, there was a mattress hanging out. So when the train stopped, we jumped off and got this mattress and put it on top of the boxcar. <laughs> and we took that, when the, we spent about three days on this boxcar that going, and they go forward. But then that made it, we take turns of sleeping on this mattress. We're on top of the boxcar? On top of the boxcar. On the mattress with a Greek and a Greek. gun. And he got off and he wasn't gone but a short time. Here he came back with a whole pot full of roast chicken and a bottle of wine. <laughs> but he didn't give us a... 
But he, he, he was trying to find his way back to England to get his discharge. He had been with the British Army. Yeah. Well, that, on the third day, we were coming in, at sundown, we were coming into a small town, and we seen some GI trucks. Now, this is one about the May the, oh, I don't know, 14th, 15th, whatever it was. And, uh, and then uh, they heard somebody hollering, all Americans and all British. So that's when we, that's when we met the American line. They got on the GI trucks, and they gave us gave us uh, sea rations, so we had we got, got something to eat. Gave us some sea rations, and then we headed for. They took us to Nuremberg, Germany. Nuremberg, yeah. And when we were in Nuremberg, Germany, they was there for a couple of days, and they wouldn't take us out of there until they had our clothes fumigated. They wouldn't put us on a plane until we got our clothes fumigated. And then they put us on. Small planes, I don't know what kind of planes they were, but there was, just, there was no benches, there was just the seats around the outside. About 15 people get on the, each plane, about all could get on. But when we got on the plane, and we got airborne, there was, a, there was a plane, I know there was a plane I was on, and there was a plane on each side of us flying together. And, uh, and one at a time, they, the pilot, would, the co-pilot would take us up to the, where they, to the, so they were there was sitting and show us a map just before we were at and kind of explain what was going on. And we'd look out and see the plane on each side. <laughs> but then we took us to Reims, France. That's where they, from Nuremberg, Germany, they took us to Reims, France to buy a plane, these little planes. And we got to Reims, France. We got our first hot meal and all new clothes. And then from Reims, France, they so took how us. So how long totally had you been a prisoner and then, then coming back? What was the total? Well, I was, I was captured on November the 5th, November of 44. The 5th. Okay. And then we were released then on May the 8th of 45. About, okay. About quite seven months. Okay. And uh, so when we left, left Reims, France of it by plane, and then we went to, on a train to Camp Lucky Strike. Yeah, like you a heard strike, of Camp yeah. Lucky Strike. That's where they brought all the POWs. That's right. And uh, well, in Camp Camp Lucky Strike, by uh, we were all tents. We lived in tents. And in, in between these rows of tents, they had ditches dug about four feet wide, maybe five or six feet deep. Because they got so much rain there, they had to do, they had to do that to keep the water from getting into the tents. That's what we need here. <laughs> right, we could use a little. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> but they they did to get a lot of rain, and. Uh, of course, and then at Camp Lucky Strike, they fed us too much. He, in fact, one guy ate, ate 32 donuts and died. Died? He died, yeah. yeah he that eating. was a problem. But then uh, the guy that passed out the butter, he had a knife about this long, he had a pound cube of butter, and he was whacking off butter. And I think that's what happened to me. I got too much butter. Because the day I was supposed to leave and come home, I, I got up that morning, and the guy says, boy, you look terrible. You better go on sick call. And where I had slept, there was just a yellow ring right around my body where I had <laughs> slept. I had perspired. And so I went on sick call, and I'm doing so. They sent me back to Rouen, France, to the 179th General Hospital. And then I was there within three weeks before I got to come home. But they put me on a special diet that got Rouen, France. And then when they, when they left uh, <coughs> Rouen, France, why they classified us, classified me as a litter patient. And in doing so, they had some German POWs carry me from the hospital and put me on a train. And then they carried me, German POW carried me off the train and carried me on a boat, a hospital ship, Acadia, to come home on. And then they put me on well, the B-deck. You, you couldn't walk then? No. Why? You couldn't walk? Well, I could, I could walk, but they classified me as letter patient. So they so had to do it to carry me. <laughs> <laughs> but you were starved to death. Yo, I mean, yeah. I mean, you just didn't have any, <laughs> yeah. But they put me on B-deck right in the middle, and because the boat was going like this, and the water coming over the front of it. But then 
I was going to be there, car on top, and they brought their meals to my bunk, and I got three back, three meals a day and three back rubs a day. Three back rubs a day. Because yeah, eight days crossing the Atlantic on a hospital ship, Acadia. Okay. And then when we came into New York Harbor, past the Statue of Liberty, I'll never forget, on the bank in New York Harbor, about a mile long, they had written in flowers, big words, welcome home, well done. You'll never forget that. Yeah, that's, that's something very beautiful. I guess so. That's the whole work they do. That must have been at least a mile long or whatever. But then they took us around the stack to our liberty there, and we landed at class at uh, in uh, New Jersey, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. That's where they took us. And then, of course, we were allowed to call our family or wife from there. But when I called her, I knew she lived in Washington, D.C. at that time, but she wasn't. I got hold of her from the person she had roomed with, but said she Jen had went back to Minneapolis to get a job. So then I, we weren't allowed one call, so I called them collect them in Minneapolis. I got to talk to her and told her that I was got to the United States and I was headed for Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver. So I spent uh, about six months in, in, in the hospital in Fitzsimmons in Denver. Recuperating. And, okay, we was there about two or three weeks, then they'd give you a couple of days, a couple of weeks just absent, and then we could go home and then we'd come back to the hospital again. And before, before they... And when you say you went home, you'd go back to Holyoke? To yeah, where? Back to Holyoke or to Minneapolis. Yeah, you know. okay. And, uh, of course, and this was before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Okay. And, of course, I, and, and, and before I left Fitzsimmons, I had orders then to report to some place in California that was going to send me to the South Pacific. Right. But then after they dropped the bombs, in Hiroshima. On Tokyo, then they changed my orders, and they sent me to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to get my discharge. So I got my discharge on December the 29th, 1945. But I stayed there a couple of days to make sure they got the they on my arm and uh, Were you st get that you on my record. So that's when I got the Purple Heart then, because they had yeah, to have information for the Purple Heart. And, uh, so during the war, now we always ask everybody this, what about your family? What were they doing? Well, my, my I, have, I had uh, two brothers joined the Army. My, my brother, older brother, he joined the Army in 1941. When I went to Washington, D.C., he didn't get a job to go to Washington, D.C., so he, he joined the Army in 41. So he, he was with the Army then for about four years. Then I had a younger younger brother. He he joined. He was he was drafted then later on, but then he didn't he didn't go into the service then until after the war. But he spent a year in Italy, guarding German POWs. Oh yeah. A year after the war. Okay. That was the. So there was you and your two brothers and then I had a in the service. Yeah, and I had a sister who joined the Coast Guard. She was in the service too. So the whole family was in the service. Yeah, but I had, but I had a younger sister. She, she was too young to, join. so she, she didn't get to join. She was the only one. <laughs> so you had a real American family, well, didn't you? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But, but my brother, they're, 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 they're still farming. We're, I live on a farm yet, and they still, they still farm too. So when you when you finished the war, you and your wife came back to Holyoke. I, I could have I had the opportunity to go back to Washington D.C. to the job that I had before. The State Department. But my dad bought me two quarters of land if I would come out and farm. <laughs> I but I always you. remembered the beautiful sunsets of Colorado, and I wanted to come to Colorado, so I I came to Colorado, and then I. We, my wife and I came, and it took her a long time to get used to Colorado, but then we had some very nice neighbor friends that she got acquainted with, and we got along okay. Right. 
So, and what did your wife do all this time? She worked in Minneapolis and Washington, D.C.? While, while I was in the service, yeah, she, she worked in Doris, D.C. Why, but just, um, well, well, when the, after the war was over, then she, she got a tra transferred back to Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and she worked in, in Minneapolis. Then. And of course, and then when I came back, then she, we came out to Colorado, but she didn't, she quit her worked job. Worked in Holyoke. You came to Holyoke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up then on a farm that my guy bought for me out of Peola, Colorado. Peola, yeah. Which is right eight miles east of Holyoke. I nine miles that, east. I Colorado. know where that is. Oh, west of Holyoke. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, show us, uh, show us your uh, medals and uh, your pictures and things, and we're going to put that all in. And this is a Purple Heart. And this is these here's got this they got little stars on which gives you which what battles what, what battles you were in. And of course this is a good good conduct medal. <laughs> I'm surprised you got that. <laughs> and then these are my this is my dog tag the German gave me. Well that's your yeah, that's, that's a, a, a dirty. Yeah, that's a uh, German prisoner of war dog prisoner tag. Prisoner of war dog tag. They took your other dog tags away, did they? No, he, you we, kept them. We kept them, yeah, but we, we had to wear these too. Oh, I see. And then, uh, how come there's? Did you get three purple hearts? No, I just got one. One, okay. But uh, just one purple heart, yeah. And you got the ruptured duck. Yeah, that's <laughs> one of these here. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. then. Uh, for the war medal. Okay. That's uh, it's got my name on. You only want to take a look at it. It's got barbed wire around the outside here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that before. Yeah. Metal. Tough one to get. <laughs> Representative Schaefer here from Colorado got me this medal. It's a French Liberty Medal. Right. And uh, those that could, I think, could be 50 years ago, uh, when they, when they after 50 years after the war, it's just been several years ago now, the GIs that got to go over to Omaha Beach were given this French Liberty Medal. But anybody that was in uh, France from D-Day until August the 31st in France was was awarded the French Liberty Medal. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, uh, Representative Schaefer said all those that couldn't go over and get it, he was going to get it for us. So he, we gave him all the information. And we were supposed to be in Greeley in September here about three years ago. And they had a meeting there where they were going to give us this Liberty Medal. But we were had planned to go to the ex National Ex-Prisoner War Convention in Louisville, Kentucky, which was on the same day. So I had a friend of mine, Dean Anderson, in Holyoke. He went to, and got his French Liberty Medal, so he brought me back mine. That's yours, huh? <laughs> that's great. So it's a, <coughs> that's it's, a nice medal. That's a nice medal, too, yeah. yeah. And I got to work in the German prison camp. I got issued 45 Dutch marks for oh, seven months' work, and I could have traded this in when I got back to the United States for four dollars and a half, but I decided to keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> right. So that, that's what the Germans paid you for that's working? That's what they paid me, yeah. And that's uh, old German currency? That's old German marks, and here, several years ago, we was over in Germany, and my wife took these along and thought maybe she could buy something with it, but they, they were all, all out of date. So just hold that right there, will you please? Okay. Now, when was that in your career? Was that well, when that you first? Was, that was taken. Uh, oh, I've taken before, before I went overseas. Before you went overseas? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Her hair has changed color. <laughs> 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 well, that's terrific. Look at that. Well, she's just as good looking then as she is now, huh? Yeah. That's terrific. <laughs>